Hi everyone, Dr. J here, and in this video we're going to talk about regulation, or as I say down below, all the stuff which is really boring until it isn't. So this section of the lecture is not going to be that exciting, I have to say, just to be honest. Um, it's going to be very important though, both for passing the Part 107 knowledge exam, and then also that later on when you're actually flying drones, and uh, potentially even doing it commercially for some of you, uh, that you'll know what you can and can't do, what your rights are, what you're able to show, what you're not able to show. Thinking in particular about uh, people coming up and saying, hey, do you have the right to be doing this? Um, you can know what to tell them and what information that you're required by law to show to, let's say, a law enforcement officer. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in. The sources of knowledge for this uh, are gonna be a couple different ones. Uh, the Electronic Code of Federal Regulation, or ECFR Part 107. This is the actual component of federal legislation that governs uh, flying drones, flying small unmanned aircraft, um, small unmanned aircraft system. The Advisory Circular 107-2A, that's some more information there. And then of course our FAA regulations and information main area. So drones are regulated in the US by the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, I don't have a lot of information right now for how drones are regulated elsewhere in the world. I'm hoping in future versions of this course to be able to add some of those international regulations in, but for the purposes of today we'll be focusing on U.S. regulations, and it's found in the ECFR titles 14 and 49. The National Transportation Safety Board is the aspect of laws governing drones that are in Title 49. And Part 107 is divided up into several subparts. Um, you can see them here. We've got general operating rules, remote pilot certification, operations over human beings, which is a newer addition to the Part 107 rules, and then subpart E is waivers. Now I want to say that regulation for UAV, UASs is currently very unstable in the sense that it's changing fairly rapidly. Um, and a, an example of that is remote ID. So remote ID was just introduced a couple of years ago as a requirement and that's gonna actually go into effect this year in September, 2023. And we're gonna talk a lot about remote ID later on um, in a separate uh, video, in a separate lecture. So just be aware, you should try to make sure as you're you know, flying drones and starting to get into this field that you be aware of how regulation is changing. So I'm gonna give you the kind of the current state of the art, um, but you'll wanna make sure that as you go forward in time, that you're keeping up with regulations in in uh, th this area. And I'll help you, give you some resources to help you know how to do that. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, to whom does the law apply? Part 107 is going to be the law regulating the use of unmanned, small unmanned aircraft systems within the United States. And this part is going to apply to the registration, airman certification, and operation of those types of vehicles. Now, some things that it specifically does not apply to is aircraft carrier applications, so delivery, um, Amazon delivery, pizza delivery, whatever kind of delivery, any aircraft which is subject to the provisions of 49 U.S. Code 44809, and this is the part of the code which is for recreational flyers. And we'll talk more about this specifically a little bit later on when we finish with regulation, um, but this is basically your trust uh, exam requirement. Any operation that falls under Section 333 or Part 91, Section 333 is an older regula regula regulation <laughs> that some still exists somewhat today, um, kind of a grandfathered in type of situation. Um, and then you have Part 91, which is going to be more uh, applying to regular manned aircraft, involves more regulation. So basic summary is, unless you're flying just for fun, a drone, an unmanned aircraft, you need at least the Part 107 certification. So you may need some other things depending on if you're doing delivery, depending on if you're uh, uh, doing crop spraying, for example. Um, but if you're not flying just for fun, you're going to need kind of at the minimum the Part 107 certification. And it's a, an important note here that the intent of the flight, not the exchange of money, is the key factor in deciding whether or not you're flying for fun. Let's say you take your drone out and you're photographing um, uh, some scenery somewhere and then turns out later that scenery, something important was happening at that place at that time that you just happened to be there taking pictures, and a local news agency asked to pay for your photographs of the site. And that's totally fine, actually, under the recreational license. Um, as long as you weren't intending to go out there and sell your photos and make money, then you can fly under the 44809 uh, uh, exemption, and you will still be legal. 
So if you're flying just for fun, if the intention is just to have fun while you're flying your drone, then you don't need the Part 107 certification. But if you're doing anything else, then you will need it in general. So let's dive into some definitions here. We've got our unmanned aircraft. We've already talked about this a lot, but this is defined specifically as an aircraft that has no possibility of direct human intervention, intervention on or within the craft. So it's a, a flying vehicle which you can't control on it or inside of it. We've got a control station. This is the interface that's used by the remote pilot to control the flight path of the small unmanned aircraft. Well, what is a small unmanned aircraft? We define unmanned aircraft. An unmanned aircraft is weighing less than 55 pounds. In other words, less than, not less than or equal to 55 in total. And that includes payloads and modifications. So let's talk about some examples. Um, you're flying a drone for doing crop spraying. Your drone weighs 40 pounds, uh, but when you add in the material for spraying, it's gonna weigh 65 pounds. So now you've exceeded the limit and you're going to have to do a slightly different certification in order to be able to fly that drone because you're over 55 pounds. Let's say you have a drone that somehow works out to weigh exactly 55 pounds. Well, that's now outside of the realm of Part 107 small unmanned aircraft. Okay. Now there's no lower limit, and this is a little bit of confusion. I, I know I've seen online some confusion about this. Even less than 250 gram drones are included. There's no lower limit on what's covered by Part 107. If you're not flying just for fun, you're covered by Part 107. In other words, if you can find a very small drone and you're taking pictures and making money, that is included in the Part 107 um, certification. The recreational flight is not. Remote pilot in command. Now the remote pilot in command is the person in charge of the flight, which can actually be one of two people. It's either the person man manipulating the controls if they're the ones who are in charge of the flight, or the FAA actually allows for a person who is not certified, Part 107 certified, to operate the controls of the aircraft if there is a certified individual directly supervising that other person with the controls. So let's say I've got my control station here. Here it is. Um, so this is a particular controller. This is actually the um, FlySky FS, uh, I think it's the I6S maybe. I forget which it is exactly. Anyway, it's a FlySky um, uh, drone controller. And let's say I'm standing here with the controls and I've got my Part 107 certification in my pocket. I'm in charge of the flight. I am the remote pilot in command. Now let's say that I didn't have my Part 107 certification yet, but I was taking a class just like you all are and I was learning about how to fly drones and I was flying the drone and there's a person with their Part 107 certification standing right next to me and in the case of an emergency, he can just take the controls and take over the flight and rescue the drone. That's the remote pilot in command. Even though they're not flying the aircraft, they're directly supervising the person who's manipulating the controls and they can take over immediately if, ne if needed. So kind of two possibilities for the remote pilot in command, either the person manipulating in charge of the flight who's manipulating the controls or the person directly supervising the person. Now it's not good enough if I am, let's say I'm flying the drone, I don't have my part 107. If that person who is the remote pilot in command, if they're in another building or if they're far away from where I am, if they're anywhere other than right by me where they can directly take over, then that is, uh, that's not allowed. That's not allowed by the regulation. Now there's, uh, there's uh, a couple exceptions to that that I will go over, um, but they still allow the person, the remote pilot in command, to take over the controls immediately and directly from the person who's flying the aircraft. Visual observer is another word, or VO, is a, a word that you'll see used quite a bit in this uh, lecture. And this is a person designated by the remote pilot in command to assist the remote pilot in command and the actual pilot when they're diff two different people to see and avoid obstacles, people, aircraft in the air or on the ground. So basically a vis visual observer is, um, let's say that you're flying somewhere and you've got kind of some low trees around you, maybe some high bush, uh, large bushes or some small trees. And it's a little bit hard to see very far away from where you are. But those trees are low so that you can, you have a very clear view of the air and you're flying your drone around up in the air, got clear line of sight, contact with the drone at all times, but you can't necessarily see around you very well. Um, and in that case, 
you're gonna we'll find out in a little bit that you're not allowed to fly over people except under specific situ circumstances. And so a visual observer is there to kind of help you be able to tell when there's people around that you need to avoid flying over. So maybe you would have a couple of visual observers stationed on either side of the place where you're flying to kind of look through the trees and say, oh, there's some hikers coming on a path or, oh, maybe there's a family coming along with some kids and you need to avoid that area with your drone. So a visual observer is, is there to help you see and identify obstacles, people, other aircraft that you will need to avoid while you're flying. And I should say some operations, some commercial operations are actually, or some waiver operations, require you to use visual observers so that you have more than one person looking for these kinds of obstacles. Calendar month. So calendar month is used in the context of deadlines. Um, and it means essentially the last day of the month. Uh, and it's used, as I said, in terms of deadlines. So for example, on December 6th, six calendar months from now means June 30th of the following year. So six months from December 6th would normally be June 6th. Um, but the fact that it says six calendar months means it's going to be the end of the month of June. So let me give you an example. Once you take the Part 107 Knowledge Exam, you don't have to take that exam ever again, at least the way the regulation stands right now. However, you must take a recurrent online training course every 24 calendar months. So this is basically just to make sure that you're aware of new legislation come out on drones. This is the FAA's requirement. You have to take get online. It's free. It's not uh, you know not a big deal, um, but you're going to have to take this recurrent online training course every 24 calendar months. So, and I yes. Um, so what that means is that if you pass the test on March 16th of 2023, let's say you take the test on March 16th this semester and pass it then by the end of March in 2025, two years from now, or two years from then, you'll be required to complete the online training. So calendar month, when the FAA says calendar month, it means by the end of the month in which you did whatever, took the test, um, or whatever the case may be. If it just says months, months is actually months as you would understand it. And so six months from, or, or let's say two years from March 16th, 2023, would be March 16th, 2025. And there's different uh, um, different things, different types of months, I guess I can say, are required for different types of um, different aspects of, or different requirements that the FAA has. Um, okay, so we've gone through some definitions. We've seen uh, just a little bit of the introduction about who the law applies to. And now we're gonna jump into the part 107 content itself.